it's time for the uh, story interview of Dragonflight. This is Novel interviewing Steve Denuser. I am very surprised this even happened. I don't. Th- I'm not sure how the newser feels about it because Nobel was extremely critical of the. I think he was extremely critical of the Shadowlands story, wasn't he? But uh, let's see what this is about. Hello, everyone. Today we're doing some Marauder special. I got to sit down with none other than Steve the Newser, narrative director for World of Warcrafts. We're getting closer to the release of Dragonflight, and while I would love for them to spoil the entire story before it's even told, I figured that it might be wiser to ask some other questions, like how did they view the way that the story is being told in the game, how did they look back at adding the Jailer at the tail end of it, or where did the center come from? All of that and more in this video. Timestamps will be in the description. Of course, thank you so much to Steve for sitting down with me and everyone else that made this happen. With that, sit back, relax, and I hope you'll enjoy. Steve, thank you very much for giving me the time of day to actually do this interview. Hello there. Oh, this is awesome. I'm ha- very happy to talk to you. It's, uh, it's, it's been a long time coming, uh, I think. Um, before I dive into the question, because I got 30 minutes and I could honestly talk to you with, uh, <laughs> about lore for five hours, uh, my understanding is that you were the lead narrative designer at World of Warcraft. Could you very quickly tell us what it's all about? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm the narrative director now of World of Warcraft, and yeah, so I oversee the the high level story, um, our kind of our planning, our plot lines as they unfold. Um, I work with a group of. So what you're saying is, guilty is charged. That's what you're saying, Steve. That's what I'm listening. Did anybody hear anything else? That's the only thing I heard. And the interview began was uh, Steve the Newser saying, guilty as charged. <laughs> Creatives to kind of flesh out. It was me. It was me that fucked up your whole world. It was me. I am the villain. Uh, what our expansion plans are and, and kind of pitch storylines and the characters that will be involved and, and those kinds of things. And then... Um, take those ideas and, and uh, talk about them with the team and energize them and get them excited about where our storylines are going and, and for all the content that they're going to build. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's really the, the main areas I oversee. We have a, a narrative team that we've built up over the years and, and they work closely with our quest designers and our content team and, and other people who are making the World of Warcraft uh, content to ensure that story is woven through everything that we do. And, and, uh, it's, it's really a joy to work in this, uh, this great, um, uh, universe that so many people like yourself have cared so deeply about. Very deeply as you, uh, most likely also read on the internet. I... And now our adventures are going to go into, <laughs> uh, the dragon flight into the dragon isles. Uh, and obviously I would love to ask you questions and like reveal the story that is to come. Uh, but I think that would be unfair. Let the story unfold itself. So I would rather talk about the design philosophy and, and where we come from as we go into the new expansion. Mm-hmm. So first of all, my question is, I've had a few friends of mine come back into the story and a lot of people on stream ask as well. They would love to experience the story of Warcraft within World of Warcraft itself. And over the years, uh, that's become rather difficult. We have patch content removed, uh, the Cataclysm revamp. In Shadowlands, for example, with the Covenants now being unlocked, all the chapters are thrown at you in one go. How does the team view this problem of, of narrative storytelling and are there any plans in the works to fix this, to make this better experience? Well, you're right that there is a ton of content that has been added to World of Warcraft over the years. And, you know, we do spend a lot of time thinking and talking about, you know, the best ways to curate that and to make it uh, accessible. And, and um, when we introduced Chromie Time, uh, that was one of the ways that we tried to, well, okay, let's, let's present these, um, you know, expansions as kind of storylines that you can, you can delve into and, and try to, um, um, you know, experience as, as uh, what it feels like to level up through those and, and play your characters through those. And um, there was a lot of successes there and, and things we want to keep refining and, and want to think about. And, um, you know, we, there's times where we have um, 
taken content out of the game, but that's never our preference. We usually try to find a way to make it still persist. Obviously, back in the day of Cataclysm, I wasn't around, so I'm not sure all the decisions that went into that, but um, you know, that was probably the, the biggest change to the existing world. It's like there isn't really an appropriate way to experience a lot of the stuff in World of Warcraft, like a lot of the old stories and stuff. There just isn't really a proper way of doing that in the game. Because you can just like, you can kind of go back, but Chromie time is very limited in terms of what it can actually achieve. And the way in which they just unlocked the chapters of the Shadowlands was completely atrocious. I mean, the story of Shadowlands overall, the whole sequence of the story to begin with, was already bad. But the way that they've done things there just made it even worse. World, and um, But these days, what we try to do is, is um, make that content accessible. And, and we, you know, we're we would love to hear from the community about your ideas about how to better surface that how to how to make it clearer where these pieces of content are um another addition we made to the game was like our campaign interface um which which didn't exist in in the mm. uh, older expansions but um that's been a great way to help people at least um have insight into kind of the thread that they're on and and the campaign that they're playing through at, at a time but we we talk about ways to you know better surface that so um it's an ongoing process and we don't feel like um we're there yet but want to keep working at it and and we have a great You're ui team that, close there um, yet. really wants to help us uh present our content in the best way possible so those are discussions we continue to have with them and imagine feedback would be on the forums or on Twitter. But then uh, one of the things people run into is, for example, in order to experience the storyline, uh, an example would be Sylvanas' motivation when it comes to work with the Jailer. Uh, they have to go to third parties, like like books, or uh, th that the books themselves are being yes. told from a perspective now, so it's not even uh, actual clear information, it's rather an opinion. This is very important. As far as I'm concerned, the entirety of the main plot needs to be experienced in the game. No ifs, fans, or buts about it. It's just, it is what it is. The entirety of the plot needs to be accessible in the game itself. No, you need to read book X or book S or whatever the hell, like all of it should be in the game. Or a character that tells the storyline. Um, what is the design plan going forward in, in Dragonflight? Can we expect the story to be in books again? Or what is the design behind that? Well, what, you know, again, I, I can't speak to the decisions that were made in in the past but what the way that i look at it for um when we when we have our novels um is that we want to tell stories that best fit the medium that they are um that the strengths of the medium okay so listen the strength of the medium when it comes to a video game is you have an interactive story and let me tell you, as someone who's played a lot of video games with a lot of different stories, it is an extremely powerful medium to tell a story. In my opinion, more powerful even than books. Now, books give you control of the story. But games allow you to interact with the characters of said story. So ultimately, it is all about how you craft that story in a good way. So to me... It's extremely important that you actually showcase the entirety of the story in the game. And the book should be complementary. That should be the nature of that medium when it comes to video games. It should be of a complementary nature. So um, the game is about gameplay and it's about playing a game. And, and certainly we have lots of cinematics and we have lots of dialogue and things like that. Um, but we want our storyline to come through through the action, through the world itself, through the places you go, the things you see happening and that your character is able to engage with. And then punctuate those gameplay experiences with highly you know, action moments that our cinematics can do really well or emotional moments that um, as, you've, as you've seen, our, our amazing cinematics team keeps leveling up their skills at being able to convey those emotions. Um, I think that books and print um, whether it's it's comics or novels, um, I think those are really good at getting inside the mind of characters 
And so when it comes to something like showing a perspective of someone, um, that's a strength of print media um, mm. as opposed to in the game where it's, it's, it's much harder to see those insights unless I'm going to say this in the nicest way possible. If that is your philosophy, if that is the way that you look at things, you should not be the person in charge of deciding the future of the story of World of War. Because basically what he is saying is that the game's not good to tell the story. That, that's, that's literally what he's saying. Like, am, am I wrong here? Am I misunderstanding? My understanding of what Steve the Newser is saying is that the game is not a good medium to tell the story. As a matter of fact, my understanding is, is like, in general, games are not good mediums to tell stories. That is what he is saying. And I'm just like, I fundamentally disagree with you on everything of that statement. Just straight up. It's like, no, you are, I'm sorry, sir, you are wrong. You are a thousand percent wrong. But, you know. Uh, Miku Monday, they've improved a lot. The end game cinematics have improved a lot uh, during the Zareth Mortis era, in my opinion. They're kind of monologuing or kind of telling you very uh, um, exposition heavy uh, kind of you know, where you're just sitting and, and listening. And some people like that, but um, we like the game to, to be much more uh, visceral in terms of you're playing through something. So, so the game is visceral. <laughs> it's visceral. More focused on the gameplay, whereas the books are to add to it. So if we take, for example, the Shadowlands as an example, uh, like Sylvanas' motivation with the Jailer, uh, the whole Liraf connection, for example, is not portrayed in the game until after the fact. Like we got Liraf added to the Ghostlands, I believe, like uh, after thing, but it, it, it's not exactly clearly explained in game. If we look at the balance that the Shadowlands have when it comes to storytelling, or for example, the Cataclysm, where uh, Karen died in a book, um, how does that balance going forward work? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to use the books to have um, major events happen. Too late, bitch. Too fucking late. Within them that you won't see in game. So like um, your example of, of Karen dying in the book or some of the stuff with uh, uh, the trial of Garrosh and how it transitioned into uh, oh, yeah. Warlords of Draenor. Like I, I would prefer that the books do more to kind of reveal extra information about things that are, you know, are, are, are happening in the world. And so in that regard, like the Sylvanas novel was, was really great in that we got to see both history that we can't really portray in the game in any um, sort of, you know, in that same depth and meaning. Um, and we also got to see some of. I can't, I can't disagree with you hard enough. I'm, I'm, <laughs> there is no end to the amount of disagreement that I have from literally everything you're saying. You're like, we can't portray these things in game. Like we can't portray history in game. And yet somehow I didn't do the uh, sepulchre, sepulchre raid, but somehow I was able to talk to um, the fuck is his name now? The, the new worthless red Lich King Bolvar. Is, is it Bolvar? No, it's, is it Bolvar or is it Tyrion? It's Bolvar, right? I forget. Whatever. But somehow, um, I was able to talk to him and he told me exactly what happened at the end of the raid. So you're telling me, well, we can't do this in the game. You're already doing it. You're literally already doing it. What do you mean we can't tell you this in the game? The fuck are we talking about? her insights uh, as she was going through things in the Shadowlands. Now, I, I, I will say that um, we could have done a stronger job of showing some of those motivations. In like, let me tell you right now, uh, we're eight minutes into this video 
And I could not think of anyone that is more wrongly positioned in this team right now than this guy. Game, and we could have done more with that as well. And that's a lesson that we learn going forward um, in terms of our, our storytelling and, and how we get those important character moments across. So um, it's always a learning process for us. You know, I, I don't think that we... Um, you know, hopefully we we try not to um, repeat ourselves, and that Fredian, we're always trying to improve. This is Steve the Newser. He is the when it comes to story in World of Warcraft, he's the big man. Unfortunately, move our craft, and and uh, you know that was that was part of the process too of thinking about Dragonflight and what kind of books we want um, associated with this expansion. And we didn't do a novel that we had mm-hmm. set between the two expansions that had a lot of backstory or had a lot of, of things that you kind of needed to know going into the expansion. We are doing a short story that, um, will be coming out, uh, in the near term, but, um, cool. but, uh, you know, that was, that was more about giving a specific moment in time that is more flavorful and it doesn't, you know, whether you read it or not, doesn't really impact, um, your Beautiful. enjoyment of, and a of short story to go into Dragonflight. Will be available on the WoW website as well, I'd imagine. Yep. The short story. Yep. Beautiful. Absolutely for, for free for everyone to read. Always great to hear. Um, about lessons learned for uh, the Shadowlands, we saw uh, a major impacts that are going to ripple on in the future of the storytelling. Uh, and when we're talking about Shadowlands, we have to talk about the Jailer. Uh, they've been retroactively added basically at the tail end of the story of Warcraft, as in the Jailer pretty much made the story of Warcraft happen up to the point of the Shadowlands, uh, if I understood it right. Um, looking back at that decision and looking back at the reception of the Jailer and how that all played out, how does the team look at that? Well, you know, I, I, I wouldn't put it that, um, I, 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 um, uh, cut, cut the commercial. I plead the fifth. <laughs> it's like, holy shit. What kind of a question was that? How dare you? <laughs> it's just like, I, 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 I. <laughs> you know, certainly the, the jailer and the influence of death um, is probably the larger uh, influence that has, uh, that has seeded through Warcraft's history. Um, and, you know, I think you can still. Come again. You wanna you wanna run that by me again? Excuse me. They'll play through that content or you know read those experiences and just take them for what they are if you want. You can play Warcraft 3 still today. Um you can play through, you know, our our Can you play Warcraft 3 today? I hear you can play Reforged, which is an inferior experience of, an inferior version of Warcraft 3. I don't know if you can actually... Well, you, I guess you can play Warcraft or you just can't do it in multiplayer. <laughs> Wrath of the Lich King expansion, now in Classic. And you can... You don't can, you dare utter the words Wrath of the Lich King. Take those stories as you want. Um, but with Shadowlands, what we were trying to show was that Death, with a capital D, is this kind of cosmic influence that has touched... Uh, Azeroth um, in in ways that were different, but yet similar to how forces like Order have touched Azeroth, or how the Void has touched Azeroth and affected its history. So, what that really was um, was about doing was showing that um, that death is a force that wants things. That all these cosmic forces are driven to become kind of the dominant force in the universe, and the jailer and what he was trying to do by uh, reaching Zareth Mortis and going into the sepulcher. Um, that was about him trying to make death the dominant force uh, in the cosmos. And and it, and while we thwarted him there, the implications of that story um, do affect how we look at these cosmic powers and uh, and their role in the universe. And so I think in that regard, there, it gave us a lot of um, 
uh, fuel for future storylines and and uh, and hopefully make fans, you know, give them some interesting things to think about and chew on. Because there was mentioned in game, I believe in the new dungeon released today, um, with the books of the first ones that there are more uh, Zeros out there. So not just for one for the domain of death, but also all the other cosmic domains. Uh, but you mentioned that, that you could still experience the story of Warcraft and the Lich King and everything that's built upon um, without the touch of the Jailer. But at the end of the day, it was the Jailer and, and combination with the Nephrius and, and the influence of the Dreadlords that caused all these events to happen pretty much since the dawn of Azeroth. If, if we take a look at all the events that happened that led into stopping the Jailer. Dude, I love how Novel's just not letting go. I love how Novel's like, I'm not letting you get away with this. Nobble's a true one right there, dude. Nobble ain't fucking around. He's like, I'm not letting you get away with this. Fuck do you mean? Fuck do you mean you can play these games and just like ignore it? No, 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 no. This is not what you said. Uh, one could argue like, okay, we had a storyline where a force like Kill Jaden or the Burning Legion had threat and responsibility, but actually it was the Jailer. Or the Titans did something, but actually it was the Jailer. Um... The, isn't that a major change retroactively to a storyline that was already established? Well, the, you know... Bro! I love this interview. Yes, thank you, Nobel. Please, please, Mr. The Newser. The, the Jailer and his allies, because it wasn't just him. He was mm -hmm. locked away in the Maw, but he had allies who were helping him, and people like Denathrius had agents of their own. So, so it was the Jailer, is what you're saying. You are now in a court, Mr. The Newser. What you're saying is, it was the Jailer. I need to get a hammer. I need to get a hammer for, like, some points of order. We can go like this and go like... Point of order! Mr. The Newser will explain why the Jailer was retroactively implemented into every single World of Warcraft story piece ever. Mr. The Newser, you will answer the question. So um, it doesn't change the things that the Legion did. It doesn't change the things that Kill Jaden put in motion. It just shows that there were other forces who were nudging some of those things along. Um, but we didn't. So what you're saying is like, if I hire somebody to murder someone, but it's never found that I'm the actual culprit, for all intents and purposes, the murderer is the one who did it. My involvement behind it, you don't need to know about that. That's fine. It's perfectly fine. It was still, it was still the murderer who did it. You will answer the question, Mr. The Newser change any of the history of uh you know the events of, Wait, of warcraft 3 what change any of the history this had agents of their own so um it doesn't change the things that the legion did it doesn't change the things that kill jaden put in motion it just shows that there were other forces who were nudging some of those things along um but we didn't change any of the history of uh you know, the events of, of Warcraft 3 or Wrath of the Lich King, those things happened just as they play out in those games. Mm. Um, we didn't touch any of that stuff. We just... W Mr. The Newser, I am fining you in $1 million for disrespect of this court and another million dollars for perjury. You fucking liar. Bro. Bro, what is this? He just said the jailer's involvement in all of these things changes nothing. The fuck do you mean? What the fuck do you mean? <laughs> I don't like the Nathrazim adding alchemicals to the water. <laughs> That turned the friggin' dwarves gay? <laughs> oh, God. Mr. The Newser, you will answer for your crimes. Move in some additional motivation and some machinations kind of behind the scenes. Okay. Um, have, you know Listen, let me, let me tell you. Actually, let's, let's do a poll. Let's do, let's do a poll right here. Need to establish this on a community level. Need to, we need to bring in our jury. 
You guys will be the jury. You guys will be the jury. We're going to be doing this throughout this video. And I'm not even a lore buff, but we're going to be doing this throughout this video. So let's see. Does the jailer change the existing, the, not the existing, the previous expansions? This is going to be a very quick poll. It's going to be a one minute. Boom. Let's see what the jury has to say about your answer, Mr. The Newser. We shall consult with the jury of the Ironbreakers, the uncorruptible jury. Does the jailer change the previous expansions? According to Mr. The Newser, he claims it doesn't. He says those things happened the way that they did. And you can look at those events the same way that you would if the jailer was not involved. Now, this jury will determine whether or not that is indeed the truth. Order, everyone, order. Get your votes in. Get your votes in, everybody. Point of order. Come on. As you can see, Mr. The Newser, the jury has found your response wanting, which means you are fined for $1 million, as I previously explained, on the penalty of perjury. You have perjured yourself, sir. May God have mercy on your soul. You know, the, the, uh, the books that, that um, you can now find in the Uldaman uh, revamped dungeon, uh, add some additional texture and thought but again they're not they're none of that is saying that the the jailer or the forces of death manipulated the titans that's still a separate storyline um it was really that there was some uh some manipulation of of the legion and what they were trying to do in order to get the influence of death rooted in azeroth that was really um uh, what was going on there because again the jailer needed that energy of Azeroth uh, mm -hmm. to be drawn into Zareth Mortis to do what he wanted to do, which was reshape the cosmos in, in his own image. Okay. Um, and speaking of Woven and Zareth Mortis and everything, uh, especially the books as well uh, that we're going to see, there's again the mention of the first ones. And if I understood the storyline with the first ones uh, correctly, once upon a time, we had the Titans that brought order to the universe, and the first ones are established as a mysterious force that brought order to the cosmic domains, if I understood it right. But it also meant that there was a woven fate, a, a true Maul Walker, uh, gateways opening to us, prophesized. A lot of it seemed to be like there was already a path destined for us. Now with the defeat of the Jailer and, and Shadowlands come to a close, are we still walking the path predestined by the first ones going into Dragonflight, or is that completely closed off now? So it wasn't that the first ones laid out an exact path that mortals were walking. I think what the what the first ones did, um, because they are these beings that kind of um, sit above the cosmic forces that we've known so far, like the Titans and the Void Lords, the first ones predate them. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, what they did was prepare for eventualities, is the way that I would put it. Um, so if you think about how like the Titans represent belief in one path, one structure, uh, and the void represents all things being possible, you could imagine that the first ones who sit kind of above them on that cosmic scale have elements of both of those things. So, um, and those are, those are different perspectives, but yet there can be ways that those, those outlooks can work together. So the things with, um, uh, that the, the first ones kind of left behind for us in the Shadowlands. Uh, it was not that, oh, you, they are going to follow this one path. It was that these are things that someday, if the, if the flow of the universe plays out in ways that they could foresee, that mm -hmm. these mortals who would become increasingly important um, for the fate of the cosmos, that they would have some of these tools available to them. 
Um, so it wasn't predetermined, but they put some, some things out there into the universe that um, might be of use for us. But the keepers in Zero of Mortis and those that we come across in the mall, they literally read our anima and they say, oh, the prophecies have fulfilled, the, the predestined mall walkers, as well as the locations are extremely precise. Like there's one in the mall that we needed, the one in the Cordovia that we needed, and one in Zero of Mortis. And Zero of Mortis is a domain where nobody was actually supposed to go. Um, but a specifically spot where we were predestined to go to that, that the keepers say like, oh, mall walker of fate, you've come here. Similar to how... Um, the jailer was not just stabbing in the dark in order to get his plans going. He could predict at the end of Wrath of the Lich King that Sargeras was not going to destroy Azeroth. He was not going to miss Azeroth. He was going to precisely stab him in such a way that the blood of Azeroth was going to fulfill his plan. So while the idea of the first ones are predestined, it seems like the storyline supports a more accurate path as we know what's going to go. Look at the face on the news <laughs> Is losing his shit. It's like, listen, it's like they put this man in a cage match. <laughs> Blizzard literally sent him out to the fucking wolves. <laughs> the, the news is about to reach that point in, in where people get to in Star Wars. Where when the shit that they're working on doesn't make any sense, they're like, look, it's a movie about space wizards for children, all right? That's, that's all. He's about to reach that point, dude. The newser's about to reach the point that like every Star Wars director involved in like the, the sequels has gotten where it's like whenever they tell them anything, they're like, look, it's a movie about space wizards for children. Why can't you just let it go? He's about to say, look, man, this is a fan. Of, like, look, I, I just took this gig because I suck at writing and I couldn't get a real job anywhere else. So, you know, I'm here. Okay. What do you want from me, Novel? Leave me alone. <laughs> dude, Novel just does not let go. He's like a dog with a bone, dude. Get him, Novel. You fucking get him. You get them for all of us. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, the thing you need to keep in mind is uh, perspective and belief as well. So like the <laughs> oh, man's about to pull out the religion card. <laughs> He's like, listen, all right. This shit doesn't need to make sense because I made it up. It's sometimes it's just that simple. Okay. It doesn't need to make sense because I made it up, okay? I pulled it out of my ass. Denizens that we, the, the attendants, for example, that we met mm -hmm. in Orbos or in Corthia. Dude, after this stream, like there was never going to be a, uh, there was never going to be a chance for me to interview anyone at Blizzard, but after this stream, <laughs> that ain't never happened in a million fucking years, baby. Woo! Or some of the um, the enlightened brokers that we met in Zareth Mortis. You know, these were people who believed in something. They they were sort of uh, they had these things. The, you know, whether you think of them as prophecies or doctrines that they believed in, um, they've been kind of waiting a very long time. Dude, I'm looking at Nobel's Nobel's face right now. If you look at his face, it, it looks like he's got murderous intent in his eyes. He's like, you son of a bitch, I fucking hate you so much, Steve. I could stab you right now. I'm going to bring out all of the dirt that you've done to this community. You're gonna fucking get done in today. And I'm gonna be the one twisting the knife. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm reading too much into it, I don't know. For some of these things to come to pass. And when somebody believes in a, in a prophecy or a doctrine like that, they look for ways to make it true when mm -hmm. when someone shows up that that does something that falls in line we see that in the real world all the time of like people want a pattern to be true or they want a theory to be true and when they see things that they can put into that pattern to make it seem true it, it feels like a prophecy fulfilled 
And so whether that's exactly true or whether it's just a point of view of these characters mm -hmm. is something that you can think about and debate. But uh, in no way has the fate of, of the mortals of Azeroth been pre-written and okay. they're just kind of walking through a script. The thing that separates mortals from magical beings is free will. That's something that's unique to the mortal soul. That's, that's what yeah. makes it distinct. Even when you were in the Shadowlands, there was a difference between souls that had come over and the things that they did versus beings that were of magic, of death magic in that case. And, and so uh, while magical beings are kind of driven by the influence that they are a part of to, to, to promote that influence, to propagate that. If we're the only ones with free will, then why the fuck did Denathrius betray the plan? If we're the only ones with free will, then why did the jailer did what he did? Because that was clearly not his purpose. The jailer, the jailer was supposed to be the arbiter. I mean, how, how did the jailer essentially malfunction if he doesn't have free will? Like, what, what do you mean? You just said that we're the ones with free will. How does it? What? I'm not even, I'm not even a lord. <laughs> Stop making fun of my story. <laughs> <laughs> influence to make try to make that influence the most dominant force in the cosmos it's mortals who have the free will to decide what their destiny is what their fate is which way they're going to do which powers they're going to embrace that's why as as players we can embrace all these different sorts of powers and use them kind of at our will it's because mortals mm -hmm. have that choice and that's unique among the beings uh who are rooted in magic I love to say like free will is very important for character design. And you mentioned earlier like that they had this this belief and that they made their own prophecies like kind of they wanted to happen. But at mm -hmm. the same time, there's like proof it's in the pudding. Like they tell us like if you are the true mall walker, this gateway as prophesied will open up for you. And wouldn't you know it, it actually opens up for us. So it does seem like the game <laughs> supports the idea of predestined. He doesn't let go. He just doesn't let go. He's like, listen, Steve, Steve, buddy, listen. Let me just tell you about how fucking wrong you are. Okay, my guy? Like, look at the news. He's seeing his fucking life flash before his eyes. Mr. The Newser, you will answer the question. But that is a debate. Oh, I would love to talk to you for five hours. You have no idea. Um, but we only have 30 minutes today. It's like, I would love to vandalize you for five hours. You have no idea. And Steve is like, bro, I don't even want to talk with you another five minutes. Fuck, not even five seconds. Get me the fuck out of this Zoom call. Holy shit. <laughs> Uh, going for the dragonfly, real quick to the first ones. Um, could you tell us, like, will we see much more influence of them? Uh, of the first ones? Yeah. Um, you know, Dragonflight is really rooted back in terrestrial Azeroth and dealing with the stories of the dragons, their connection to the Titans. That's a big storyline. Um, so, no, this isn't this isn't an expansion that's rooted in the cosmic powers or, you know, the, the, the stories of the first ones, really. It is really mm -hmm. focused on the aspects um the kind of legacy that they have that connect is like yeah that story didn't really pan out people didn't really like it very much because they felt like i was just pulling too much bullshit out of my ass so no no first ones of this expansion no sorry action <laughs> to the titans like uh, emerald dream oh emerald yeah dream. Life the, domain. The emerald dream, all of that <laughs> stuff um so we really wanted to root the story in this you know those those Beautiful. cosmic themes are out there and they'll certainly inform uh future plot lines and things like that but but dragonflight is really about uh what's going on in azeroth with the aspects awesome like honestly i hope i don't come across as too uh too rough or too cross because it's all out of a, a passion for a world of warcraft <laughs> and a storyline that we all love um, and I have a passion for tearing you and you asshole, Steve. I will do this with passion. <laughs> I understand. Very excited about Dragonflight as well. Like so far, what we've seen going back to the ground, I think not just the game mechanics, but also storyline build up is great. Um, I think we've got like a couple more minutes left. So I got a lightning round of questions that I'm very curious about. Um, Azeroth has been said to be cleansed of the old gods. Nazoth, Kafun, Yaxaran, Yasharaj, all gone. Is that true? 
the influence of the void as embodied by the old gods uh, has not gone away. While we've defeated some. So you have lied to us yet again, Mr. The Newser. That's another million dollars for perjury. Some of the, you know, the old gods themselves. Um, we did beat them on the mortal plane after all, and they are not mm -hmm. beings of the mortal plane. And if you can extrapolate some of the kind of cosmic rules of what that means, um, then that kind of gives you your own answer, or at least some things to think about. You know, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to follow it up, but I love it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, okay, so we've seen the time skip in-game, and just today on the PTR, we got like the wedding of Lorfmar Felistra. Uh, some time has passed on Azeroth, just to give it a chill moment. Now, we've also seen at the Forsaken that they have unlocked the power to cleanse the Blight from Lordaeron. Um, what about Gilneas? Will we ever see the return of Gilneas for the Worgen? Is that perhaps something in the works? Um... The uh, that is a storyline that we have not forgotten about. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the centaur on the Dragon Isles. Uh, in the collector's edition, it clarifies that the centaur are that the ones we know are merely a a copy of the ones that came before the ones on the Dragon Isles. So, where exactly did the ones on the Dragon Isles come from? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a copy per se, but what I would say is that there, that centaur are a native race to Azeroth. They've been around for a long time. And so they they date back to the time when the, there was the supercontinent of Kalimdor. And so the uh, Maruk centaur that we see in Dragon Isles, um, the centaurs were very contentious, just like the ones that we know today. And the Maruk broke off because they were a bit more enlightened. They wanted to get away from the conflict. And that took them to the to the, the lands that would be the Dragon Isles. And really, the, the centaur that had existed in the rest of, of Kalimdor um, just fought one another to extinction. And so you didn't see the, you know, the centaurs that were um, kind of more located in, in central Kalimdor died off. And it was just the Maruk that we know of mm -hmm. that uh, that persisted. But the that doesn't change the mythology that we know of the centaurs and the Kalimdor centaurs of modern Warcraft. Um, they were kind of reintroduced to the world through those magical means. Uh, and so the the centaurs we know today are kind of their own uh, reintroduction, I guess you would say. Um, but the roots of of centaurs date back to um, the early history of Azeroth itself. Okay, so the original centaur, they were always just there, um, because we were kind of wondering, like, should we have Zedifus and, sorry, Fedadras and Zetar, son of Scenarius, mm -hmm. they got together and they made the centaur that we've always known. And now we've got these original ones. So the whole idea of Scenarius together with um, uh, Fedazane is not a thing. They were just native creatures of the land. Well, again, like I'm, we're not changing that storyline at all, but that was a reintroduction of, of new tribes of centaurs to the world. The older ones, apart from the Maruk, as mm -hmm. far as we know, had died off. Okay. And they were just there, similar to like the Tauren, how they were always there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, the mortal races, you know, they've, they've evolved over time as well. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, from that, from that kind of primordial age when mortals first started to emerge. Okay. This one, uh, I'm already ready for a shutdown. Um, there's been some data mine stuff when it comes to the Green Dragon Ysera. Uh, in the Collector's Edition, we also see a, a beautiful symbol of Ysera and Rafion, but not her daughter Marifra. Um, but Ysera has been bound in the Shadowlands to Ardenweald. What does that mean for her future in Dragonflight? Well, that is a that is a big storyline that plays out um, through the, the course of Dragonflight. And yeah, it's it's... What that means is exactly what you think. That because of the introduction of Shadowlands, death has essentially become fucking meaningless in Azeroth. That's what that means. I, I don't think it's a secret at this point to say that Isera is certainly evol involved in the storyline, but her role needs to change because she is she was awakened in Ardenweald through the Winter Queen's direct intervention. And that means yeah. that she didn't get reborn through the normal cycle of slumbering at Arden Wield, um, then the emerging into the dream. And if she had done that, then maybe she could have returned to Azeroth as she was. But now she is bound to that power. And so she is she is bound to both life and to death. And that's going to have implications on her storyline. And uh, Marithra is very much a part of that story as well. 
Beautiful. Yeah, if a loon wheels it, she will uh, soar through the skies again. Okay. Um, dragons and the domain of order are going to play their part in the storyline, as we've already seen from uh, the whole primalist section coming up. Uh, could you hint at other uh, primal forces that we might see play a part in the expansion? Some of the cosmic force, I should say. Sorry. Um, again, it's it's we're not really delving into the cosmic forces as these kind of disembodied things. Um, mm -hmm. There's certainly Titan stuff that that plays out in this expansion because the history of dragons and titans are so tied together. And in fact, when when we when the expansion starts, um, Alex Straza is looking for a way to re-empower the aspects because they've got this enemy that they need to face and they were only able to defeat before when they were at their full strength and they're much diminished now yeah. compared to what they once were and her first instinct is to well tear isn't around anymore so how could we re-empower themselves uh, re-empower ourselves and in the dragon isles are these uh oath stones that yeah. were the symbol of the titan's bond with the dragons and she thinks that if they can set the flights right, that will re-empower these oath stones, and maybe that magic can restore the aspect. So that's guiding us through the level up experience of dragon flight, and you'll see those those oath stones. Um. Five hundred thousand dollars for spoilers. You will abstain yourself from spoiling any more of this storyline, Mister Mister the Newser. through the course of the story and whether that works or not um whether she has to try something else um that remains to be seen but that that relationship between the dragons and the titans both in their history and the implications of that uh, are very much part and parcel of this storyline awesome yeah it's it's one of the more interesting ones so the feedback i've seen so far like it's it's reminiscent of the Kyrian storyline with the with the Malsworn, where you see that there's uh, this story established and yet there's more to it now when it comes to Kyrian and Malsworn, we saw that for example devils was was quickly taken off the stage and we were quickly allying to just the Kyrian. it's their way even though at the end of the fact it was shown that the Malsworn actually had a valid point it feels similar to the Dragonflight storyline as it's building up so far. For those worried that we might have a repeat of history, do you have anything to say to them? Uh, in terms of repeating which part of history? Uh, just signing up with the Kyrians, like just, for example, just signing up with the Titans, they're the good guys, and, and their other point of view is swept mm -hmm. to the side, and we're just going to wipe them out. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think that some of our, our best villains, you know, both in Warcraft and in, in other media, um, start with having understandable motivations. And when you look at the incarnates, um, the first one of which is Razageth that we see unleashed, um, and you think about what the primalists were, were being driven by, um, they, have a, they have a valid point. Their, their entire uh, uh, philosophy was just rooted in this idea that dragons should not be touched by outside influences. They should be free to be their own beings and, and not be changed by the magic of the titans for example mm. and that that was a disagreement at first and yeah the um the dragon aspects basically got their covid shots and the primalists did disagreements led to conflict and conflict led to war and what makes someone a villain is not necessarily the ideology they have all the time. Sometimes it can be the actions that they will take in service of that ideology. So yeah. with the incarnates, even though they started in an understandable place, they've done some very nasty things throughout history. And we will learn more about that as the story unfolds. And we will see that they, they, they started out with, again, those, those relatable intentions, but ended up in a place that the aspects really had to, uh, to fight against them for the sake of, of preserving not only their own kingdom, but, but Azeroth as a whole. Beautiful. Like, honestly, the, the, the things that you're saying right now, it's making me more and more excited about the story of Dragonflight. Flight, honestly, with, with that mindset. Uh, I think we're just about uh, out of time. My last question to you is, uh, if you had to pick one thing to be most excited about for the story of Dragonflight, Flight, without spoilers, what would it be? Uh, it, it honestly is just uh, adventuring alongside the aspects and seeing them be awesome again. You know, they've after giving up their powers to defeat Deathwing, they had a downturn. And, you know, they've been kind of adrift a bit. 
uh, in terms of you know what their what their future was, what they were doing, um, and this whole expansion is really about making these characters awesome again, and to soar alongside them, uh, you know, like you saw it in our yeah. cinematic. This that feeling of being in their presence and seeing them do these awesome things and helping them, um, you know, re find not only the greatness that they once had, but like what is their future. Um, yeah. That's just an awesome, fun story to tell, and and I'm super excited. Uh, our whole team really embraced that, and and was was excited about all these characters, and I think that love and care will come through as you're playing through the expansion. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I uh, I hope everybody at home is as hyped as I am, and thank you very much for your time for uh, answering all of our questions. Yeah, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Let's talk cool. again. Yes, please. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye. And there you have it, the end of the interview. Again, thank you so very much to Steve and everybody else at Blizzard for making this happen, for sitting down with me and uh, letting me do this interview. I had a blast. I um, I think I mentioned it mid-interview. I could sit down with them for six hours and, and deep dive into the story that they're being told, that they're doing, feedback on and all that. All in all, my major takeaway from this is that they're telling me everything right. They're, they're telling me uh, that there's going to be an adventure in, in Dragonflight, that we're going to go back to basics, that instead of dealing with fractures and, and cosmic forces, like the cosmic forces will play their part, but they're not going to take front and center. That has me excited. And and I mentioned this during the reactionary trailer for uh, the pre-patch. Um, when they drop a trailer or cinematic and, and my reaction to it is pretty much one-on-one -on -one with how they wanted to convey it, that means they got a mindset when it comes to the storytelling. Obviously, uh, interviews, uh, I, I'm hoping that the mindset is actually going to become a reality. I'm hoping that we're going to see that delivered within Dragonflight. I'm excited for the launch. I'm excited for the coming month. And beyond that, only time is going to tell. For now, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed this one. And until next time, see ya! Okay, I already linked the video. I'll link it one more time. And uh, you guys should come in here, hit the like button. You know, subscribe if you're interested in more novel stuff. And definitely give it some watch time, like let it play in the background or something. Um, my thoughts on it are, it's like, look, through the stuff that Steve Denuser said at the very beginning of the interview, I fundamentally just think that he's the wrong person for the job. Because in his mind, it's like, oh, I can never really tell the story I want to tell in this video game. And to me, it's like, well, if you can't, if you don't have the technical capabilities or the inspiration to tell your story uh, throughout using the video game as a medium to tell your story, then you're just, you're just the wrong person for the job. It's like me going to, to work at McDonald's to flip burgers, and then I get there, and I'm like, I can't, I can't do both sides. I can only do burgers on one side. And people are like, what the fuck do you mean? It's like, I don't like flipping them. I just want to do it on one side and serve half-cooked burgers. That's what I want to do. What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired because I'm basically saying I don't like this aspect of my job where I have to actually flip the, the fucking burger, which is what he's saying. He's like, I, I can't tell the story through using the, the game as my medium. And I'm like, well, then what the fuck are you doing here? Like, I'm sorry. Go write books or whatever it is that you want to go do. But if you can't tell the story through the medium that you're supposed to be telling the story through, then nothing's ever really going to change. Like, there's a fundamental problem with the story in World of Warcraft. And this is not the right guy to solve it, basically. Because, I mean, that, that's literally what he says in the interview. I mean, you can say whatever you want, but that's what he says in the interview. He's like, yeah, I, was, I can't do it. It's like, well, fuck. Well, if you can't do it, then we need to get somebody who can. <sighs> anyway, um, uh, besides that, I think it was a very interesting interview. I think that uh, Nobel was amazing in the interview, uh, requesting a lot of answers to a lot of inconsistencies that we got throughout the narrative of the Shadowlands and Obviously, the newser did not have 
the the proper answers for him because he was never going to because at the end of the day novel has a better understanding of the storyline than the person in charge of the storyline which is just like it's kind of like a sad state of affairs but that you know it is what it is and that's that video